Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much for joining me. Uh, if we could just start off, if you could just let me know whether you can hear me, that would be great. I think I've unmuted myself. I think I've got everything set up. If you can go to the ch either the chat, uh, the chat section or the Q&A section, just put a little note in there and let me know that you can hear me. That would be fantastic. And we'll get started. Yeah, there we go. Fantastic. That's great. OK, thank you very much for that. I really appreciate it. So let me just clear those questions off. So a bit of housekeeping to start off with. You'll see that on your menu, you've got a Q&A. You've also got chat. Now, if you're going to if you're going to put any questions for me whatsoever, um, all the way through this webinar, please put them in the Q and A. If you put if you put them in the Q and A, even if I get thirty questions, I have to answer that question. Um, I have to address that question and answer that question before I can move on to the next one. If you put your question in chat, then I might not see it because chat is like Twitter, and if loads of people put loads of comments in chat then I, I might miss a question and I can't go scrolling through the whole thing. But if you put your questions in the Q&A section, then I will see um, that you've asked that question. So, um, yeah, please make sure you do that. Use the Q&A section. I'd really appreciate it. And it means that you're going to get your question answered as well, because I, I am not averse to answering any question that you have. Um, I might leave it till the end, but I'm quite happy to answer questions. Now, you might see on the screen that we've got the title here is deal sourcing and trading. Well, it's not that's not quite the, the title of this webinar. The title of this webinar is how to build a six figure property sourcing business. We know how to do this. You can see our name at the top of the of, at the top of this sheet of pe uh, sheet of paper. Right. We are sourced. We've got 220 ish franchisees around the country and we help them build their property businesses. Now, roughly 50 percent of those franchisees um, concentrate on deal sourcing and trading because they're looking to build their cash flow. The other 50 percent might be doing different things like flips or building a HMO portfolio or doing commercial conversions or any any other kind of property strategy. This is by far the most the most common strategy that our network of franchisees um, uses because it gives cash flow. And there are very few other strategies within the property industry. I don't know why I'm telling you you're converted to this. This is why you're here. There's very few other strategies in property that give you cash flow as quickly as deal sourcing and trading. So without further ado, let's get into the meat and bones of this and let's show you how to build your cash flow. Now, first of all, why is it so popular? Well, cash flow is really popular because first of all, like I said, not many uh, strategies within property do give you a decent cash flow. But secondly, you're growing a business, right? This is one of the things that I think a lot of people get wrong when they first start to look at property as a way of generating revenue, of making money, right? They forget that what fundamentally they're doing is they're starting a new business. And if you started any business in any sector of anything, the first thing that you would focus on is cash flow. And it seems a bit weird that people come into property and because they come into property um, and they might have no experience whatsoever, but they'll come into property and they'll think, right, what are we going to do? Let's go for a massive deal. Let's make a million pounds. And they start to look for the big stuff rather than the small stuff. If you started a business in any other sector at all, the first thing that you would focus on is your cash flow. And property should be absolutely no different. We actually have three tiers. We, ha we have a way of going through um, the, the sort of the life cycles of property. And we start off with cash flow. Then we move on to making profit and then we move on to building that portfolio. That's the way that we address and we help our franchisees grow their businesses. To start off with, it has to be about cash flow. And again, that's why deal sourcing and trading is such a popular thing. Like I said, we've got maybe 100, 110, 120 franchisees that focus specifically on deal sourcing and trading. And some people... Right. This is this is going to be a, the first sort of um, light bulb moment for you. The, some people only do deal sourcing and trading. Right. They don't start there to then grow a business and then move on to flips and then move on to commercial conversions and move on to generating six figures or seven figures. Some people start with deal sourcing and just scale a deal sourcing business. And this is one of the one of the franchisees that we have, Shahid. He's done exactly that. So instead of building a deal sourcing business and then moving on to a different property strategy. He's just scaled and scaled and scaled his deal sourcing business. He sold 22 service accommodation deals within 48 hours. 
So he he secured those deals. I'm going to talk to you about that. He um, did the due diligence for those deals. I'm going to talk to you about that. He put them on our app or he advertised those deals out to investors. And within 48 hours of advertising those deals, and we helped him out with the advertising because we've got an app that we, we, we let our franchisees use. I'll talk to you about that. He sold 22 deals. So £5,000 per deal, 22 deals sold within 48 hours. That's a significant amount of money that he's just made in that month. He consistently sells 15 plus deals per month. So we've shown him, we've helped him to scale his business to the point where he doesn't need to do anything else now. He doesn't need to move on to commercial conversion. Because if, if, he, if he starts doing something else now, that's a risk, right? It's a risk because he's never done it before. It's a path that he hasn't trodden. But with the deal sourcing, he has trodden that path. And so he will continue to do that. So 220 franchisees, this is by by no means all of them, uh, 220 franchisees across the UK and approximately half of them do deal sourcing and trading. Now, one of the other good things and what one of the reasons that deal sourcing and trading is so popular amongst our franchisees is that you can do it either full time or part time. You can do it like Shahid's done it and focus on it and absolutely nail it in the way that Shahid's done it. Or you can do commercial conversions or you can do new builds. And then as a side project, you could be selling deals in order to supplement your monthly income. Because if you sell to, you know, two deals a month, that's still going to be roughly about 10 grand which is going to help you go through these bigger projects as well. So it's a very, very flexible, a very amenable and very adaptable strategy. But the problem, the problem that comes with that is that because it's so flexible, people don't understand the process. They don't understand the process. They don't understand how to do it. And you constantly see on social media that debate of, what comes first? If I'm starting a deal sourcing business, what comes first? Is it the property or is it the investor? Well, we've got a very set process and that's what I'm going to communicate to you today. That's what I'm going to give you today. I'm going to show you what our process is and I'm going to explain why our process is built that way. And I'm also going to give you some, um, some exclusive content that I don't think we've given out anywhere before other than to our franchisees to show you how to execute that process. So I'm going to explain exactly how to do it and how to do it in a way that not only works if you're just going to sell one deal a month, but also works if you're going to sell 20 deals a month. So why would you be here? What is it, what is it about sourcing that, that creates a problem? Well, like I just said, first of all, it's not having a process. And if you don't have a process, you can't scale because you're probably running around like a headless chicken trying to do everything for everybody and not really getting anywhere because nobody, nobody bites, nobody, nobody, um, you can't close down any of the sales that you're looking to close down. Another big problem is compliance. Now you need to be compliant. You need to understand what your compliance, um, what your compliance liability is, because you are essentially acting, um, especially if you're getting uh, off market deals, if you're getting deals that aren't going through an estate agent, you are acting as an estate agent and therefore you need to have the same compliance in place as an estate agent does. And if you don't do that, then there can be a significant, there can be significant fines in place. Another problem that um, I see people have is that they can't secure deals. That they, they go to estate agents, they find a deal that they think is really good. They go to the estate agent and they completely muck it up. And the estate agent has got no interest whatsoever of taking their property off the market just to give the source of the opportunity to sell that deal. Well, what if I said to you that you didn't need to secure deals? If you've got the right process in place, you don't need to secure deals. We've got some other, like I said, we've got lots of franchisees that are executing this strategy. We've got some of our best performing franchisees never secure a single deal. And yet they'll sell between five, five to eight deals per month every single month sorry i just put you on mute for a second because i had a little cough um so you don't need to secure deals in order to sell deals that is absolutely another light bulb moment 
agents don't want to work with you. So whether you're buying buying through an agent or not, agents just don't want to work with you. And you can't find serious investors. So you struggle to find properties, you struggle to find investors, you struggle to find deals, um, and you can't you can't network, you just can't, you know, get into this this industry because nobody seems to want to work with you. This is the these are the common problems that we see from deal sourcing. So what I'm going to teach you today is how uh, how to start the first things that you should be doing to start. I'm going to teach you the process from beginning to end. I'm going to teach you how to how to sell deals that you haven't secured. I'm going to teach you where to find investors. I'm also going to teach you what to say to investors. And I'm going to teach you the process in which you get paid and where you should be getting paid in that overall process as well. So we're going to go through all of that today. Ooh, let me just go back. The first thing that I want to do, though, now that we've started, is I want to ask you some questions. So let me... I've put a question, uh, I've put a poll on the screen. So the, 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 the poll is, what is holding you back? And I'd really like you to answer that question on the screen for me, please. So what is holding you back from starting a deal sourcing business and making a significant amount of money from your deal sourcing business? That's great. Thank you very much. Keep them coming if you can read through. So what is holding you back? So the, the answers are you can't find the right properties or you can't secure the properties. You can't find the investors. You don't have a process or all of the above. So all of the above might be, you know, that might uh, describe your situation really well. I see that nobody's nobody's ticked the last option here, which is nothing. I'm absolutely flying, which is interesting. OK. I'll just leave it on the screen for a couple more seconds and then we'll move on. So I, I, I don't know whether you can see the screen. I don't know whether you can see the answers. So let me just uh, let me just tell you. 40% um, of people said that all of the above. So 40% of people that are on the webinar right now have a problem with the entire process and finding properties and speaking to investors. 30% of people that have then said that they don't have a process. 13% uh, of people have said that they can't find investors. 10% uh, of people have said that they don't have the right properties. And 8% of people said that they can't secure the properties. So that is very, very interesting. All of the above. Well, from my point of view, that means that you're going to get a lot of um, a lot of uh, value out of today's webinar. So, you know, I'm really pleased about that. Although for you, that must be a, a fairly painful thing to know that you want to get into property, to know that you're you know, you've got this this desire to get involved in property. I'm just going to put you on pause again. Um, sorry, just had a little, another little cough. Um, to know that you want to get involved in property, but then to just be stuck and to not make any progress at any point. You know, you can't break down the process. You can't find investors. You can't find properties. It must be very, very frustrating. So let's take a step back. Let's think about how we're doing this. And let's make some serious moves forward. First of all, the first thing that you have to do is sort out your compliance because you need to make sure that you are trading compliantly in the property world. Because if you get a bad reputation, if your name is tarnished because, you know, there are, there are complaints that go into the PRS or to the TPO about you. Um, and when people Google you, they can see that you've had complaints raised against you in the past that's going to affect your performance, right? So instead of flying by the seat of your pants and thinking, ah, oh, you know what? I'll just sell the first five. And then after I've done that, I'll then get compliant because I'll have made some money by then. Let's not mess around, okay? Sort your compliance out first. Sort the compliance out first. Get it in place. It's going to cost you some money. Of course, it's going to cost you some money. You're starting a business. You're starting a business that's going to generate you some revenue. So get your compliance in place. Spend that money on the compliance and, you know, use that as, as motivation to earn that money back. But much better that you do it that way rather than taking a risk and potentially jeopardizing anything that you do in property moving forward. So, first of all, you need to be registered with either the PRS or the TPO. So these are what the PRS is a, the property redress scheme and the TPO is the property ombudsman. 
you need to be registered with one of these uh, one of these two agencies. They're government approved um, in case somebody wants to complain about you. So these are independent companies. And if somebody wants to complain about you, they can go to one of these company companies. One of these companies will listen to their case. They'll contact you. They'll find out your side of the story and then they'll adjudicate as to who's in the right, who's in the wrong, whether you need to pay a fine or whether you're uh, the person that's complaining about you is being unreasonable. Uh, I've just had one question, which is how much roughly does it cost to be compliant? I'm going to I'm going to go through them individually. Um, Omar, thanks very much for the question. I'm going to go through them individually and I'll tell you the cost individually. I think that the cost of um, the PRS membership is something like 120, 130 quid for a year. So that's the cost for a, for a PRS membership. I think the TPO is fairly similar. There's some variance, but it's fairly similar. It's under 200 quid in order to be in order to have that level of compliance. You will also need to have an AML registration. Now, like I said to you earlier, you are um, you are acting as an estate agent and estate agents need to be registered with HMRC for AML because you need to do AML checks on your customers. So any of your customers that are looking to buy a property through you, you need to do an AML check on just like an estate agent does. So you need to make sure that you're registered with, with uh, HMRC for AML, and that's going to cost you about uh, three, three to four hundred pounds, something like that. And that, again, is per year. You are a, you are a business, so you need to have insurance. The minimum insurance that I would have if I was starting a deal sourcing and trading business is PL, which is public liability and PI, which is professional indemnity. Now, we've searched uh, far and wide for insurance for our franchisees. Uh, we work with some specific companies that understand exactly what is needed for, for property sourcing. Um, and it took us a long time to, to, to get these companies. So it might take you a while to get this in place. But when you do get it in place, it's probably going to cost you between 350 and 400 pounds for a year. Um, I've had a question from uh, Side who says, do you have to be registered with both PRS and TPO or would one suffice? That is a really, really good question. Uh, so I'm sorry that I didn't make that clear. Yes, you choose either PRS or TPO. You don't need to be registered with both. That's exactly right. So that's the, the, the minimum amount of, of um, compliance that you need to have in place to run your deal source in business. One of the other things that you need to do as well along the process, which we'll come to and I'll show you exactly where in the process you do this, is KYC. So you need to do KYC checks, which are know your customer. Because your customer is buying something from you that is high ticket, that is, is a, it comes at a significant cost, you need to do KYC checks to, to show that you have a relationship with that person. So that could be ID checks, um, you know, the kind of the kind of things that are actually quite annoying. I'm just going to put you on mute. Such as um, an ID check, a proof of address check um, and a bank statement, something like that. So you need to do KYC checks as well. I'll show you when when we do that, when we run through the process. And this is the process. That's it. That's the whole process right there. Uh, obviously, what I'm going to do next is I'm going to explain it to you. But that is essentially the process. There's only a few steps to it. It's all about how you um, put your own personality onto this process and own this process for your own. Um, that makes the difference between whether you're successful or whether you're not successful. We've rolled out this process to literally hundreds of people who have varying degrees of, of um, sales skills and varying degrees of success in property previously. And it's worked for everybody because we've paired it right back to what is absolutely necessary and we've made it a sales process. So even if you're not salesy, you can use this process and you can win because we've we've helped you out and we've we've spelled out the places that you need to be salesy in this process. Um, I'm just getting a couple of questions through, so let me just read through them now. If starting off in deal sourcing with little on the table in terms of deals, is this the very first action I should take? Reese, if I was in your position, I wouldn't want to be scrabbling around trying to sort out insurance 
um, when I had a deal on the table that I had to sell within 72 hours. You know, that is the truth of it. Some deals that you come across will have a limited shelf life and you've got to put all of your time and effort into um, talking to investors and getting that deal off your books and sold. Now, if you're if you're trying to sort out your insurance and negotiate or find out which PRS membership is the right one for you and talk to an in, talk to uh, some brokers about uh, about, you know, different policies that you're looking at as well, then you're not going to do the best job that you possibly can. For me, this comes down to a, a question of confidence. If this is something that you're serious about and you want to move forward with it and you're going to be successful at this, then just get it sorted out. Get it sorted out, put it to one side and you don't have to worry about it now for the next 12 months. Now, all of your focus and effort can be put into selling deals. And that's where I would want to be. Uh, is this webinar being recorded as I will have to go back to work soon? It is being recorded and I'm sure you, uh, my marketing team will send out a recording link to you uh, in an email that will follow up once we've finished this webinar. So let's go through this first of all. First of all, what is your strategy? Now, this is a really, really pertinent question, right? What deals are you going to sell? And how do you determine what deals you're going to sell? Well, that some of you are going to be sitting there thinking, well, that depends on what the what the customer wants. That depends on on the, the person that I'm talking to, to the investor. What deals do they want to buy? That's the wrong answer. Right. The deals that you're selling should be based on the strategy that you want to execute. Doesn't make sense. Right. Why? Why is he saying that? Why is he saying that it's based on what I want to sell? Well, let me explain. If you go to a networking event and you talk to five investors, those five investors are probably going to want different deals. You're probably going to find somebody that's commercial conversions. You're probably going to find somebody else that wants rent to rent HMOs. You'll find somebody else that wants to buy their own HMOs. And you'll find somebody else that wants to do flips. So each one of those investors has got a different strategy. And for you to find deals for each one of those investors, you're going to have to network and build relationships with different people. For the rent to rent person, you need to build a relationship with the letting agents. For commercial conversions, you need to build a relationship with commercial agents. For flips, you need to build an, a relationship with estate agents. There's three. The first three have got completely different um people that you need to talk to and build relationships with straight away. That is the least uh, efficient way of starting that business. It is suboptimal. That's why we say what you should be doing is building your, your deal sourcing business based on what you want to do. So if you know, if you've looked at all the different property strategies and you know that the, the strategy that you want to focus on is flips, let's say, and I'm saying flips because at the moment, the market seems to be um, quite good for flips. We're getting a lot of our franchisees that are buying flips and and uh, doing them up and then selling them, selling them on for a, a decent amount of profit, um, more so than we have in the last six years. So the market right now is good for flips. So if you want to do flips, what you should do is you should go to estate agents and you should build uh, build relationships with everybody that can give you flips. Now, if you find a flip that is, let's say, um, discounted, it's below market value and it's below market value to 50 percent of the value of the property, you can probably buy that property using a, a high street lender without putting that much money into the property. Right. You can probably do you could probably almost everybody here could probably buy that as long as you haven't got bad credit or issues with with raising finance. Almost everybody here could could buy that property. But what if you find something that it's not quite 50 percent below market value? Maybe it's 20 percent below market value. Well, if it's 20 percent below market value, you might you might not have enough money to buy that property because the closer to market value it is, the more money you need to put into it yourself. So if you can't buy that property, it's still 20 percent below market value. That's the kind of deal that you should be selling on. So if you're out there 
trying to execute on your property strategy, the strategy that you've chosen, and you find something that's got enough of a margin for you to buy it yourself, you buy it. And if you find something that hasn't quite got enough of a margin for you to buy it, buy it yourself, you sell it to an investor. Now, all of that time, you're only looking for one strategy, which is the strategy that you want to execute. Because let's face it, right? It doesn't matter which strategy you choose. You can name any property strategies, title splits, commercial conversions, HMOs, service accommodation, rent to rent. It doesn't matter. There's plenty of people out there that are looking for those deals. So whichever one you choose, you will have an audience out there. You just need to communicate with them. So you choose your property strategy. And then that's the strategy that you also sell on when you find deals that don't quite have enough of a margin for you to execute. So that is the first tip. It's got to be based on you and building your property business. I've got another question. Let me just go there. Can we use multiple strategies at the same time? That is a really good question. And you know what? I didn't make it clear. You can, but you'd be wasting your time. Honestly, you'd be wasting your time. The reason you'd be wasting your time is you're spreading yourself thin. Even if you're doing one or two, two strategies, even if you're doing two strategies, you are spreading yourself thin, right? You need to stay focused. Part of this, part of the, especially getting set up in property, especially getting started in property, part of the makeup of the people that are successful at this is that they're disciplined and they're patient. So if you're the kind of person that you know, you know, loses faith quite easily and moves on to something else, then moves on to something else, then moves on to something else, that's a character trait that you need to deal with. Because it's far better that you stick something out and make a success of it and then move on to something else once you've already made a success of it. Oh, this is a good question. Which is better, focusing on a particular strategy or focusing on a particular area? Um, I would say that's a really good question. It's better to focus on a strategy because you'll get more people interested in your deals based on the strategy than you will on the area. Because if you've got a deal that's um, a HMO and it's going to return you, let's say it's got a 12% net yield, that's a really strong yield. And some people, um, if, if that deal's in, I don't know, the first, the first town that comes into my head is Worcester. I don't know why. Um, but if that deal's in Worcester and somebody was only looking in Hereford, you know what? They might be convinced to go across to Worcester for twelve percent for a twelve percent net yield. But if they if you had another if you had a, a flip in Hereford and not a HMO, I think they're much less likely to to change their strategy just because you found something in Hereford. So I think you're far better off focusing on the strategy. More people seem to be focused on strategy and more loyal to the strategy than they do to the location. Oh, there's a lot of questions today. Yeah, I've got another one. Just uh, bear with me a second. How do you network with agents if you're not targeting an area? Don't quite understand that question, uh, Mark. How do you network with agents if you're not targeting an area? So... Um, you know what? Let me get to the to the deal sourcing bit because we're going to talk about how to find deals. Um, OK, so we've gone through the strategy. Now we're going to find deals. There's a couple of things that I need to make absolutely clear when we're finding deals. First of all, selling deals on right move. You absolutely can do that. There isn't a problem with doing that. Secondly, due diligence. I see lots of lots of deals that are put onto um, put onto places like social media, where the absolute bare minimum of uh, due diligence has been done on those deals. Well, if you follow our strategy, if you follow the way that we do it, every deal that you look at, you're first looking at as if you're going to buy it, and the amount of due diligence that you do on on every deal that you sell should be similar to 
as if you were going to buy the property yourself. Don't cut corners when it comes to doing due diligence, because what will happen is you'll you'll find a deal. You'll do your due diligence. You'll stop at some point and go, oh, you know what? That's fine. They can they can do the due, due diligence themselves. And then you can rely on the investor to do their due diligence. But to start off with, the investor is going to look at your due diligence and they're going to take your numbers as being the gospel. And they might not double check your numbers straight away until they get the survey done. Now, we're talking four to six weeks down the road, down the down the line here. And they get the survey back and the survey doesn't add up. And then they start to do their due diligence in a bit more detail. And they come back to you and say, hold on a minute. You said this, but that's not true. It's this. And it works out that you've got your numbers wrong because you haven't gone into that much detail with your due diligence. And then guess what? The investor pulls out. You've just wasted six weeks of your time and their time. So the way that I look at due diligence is the more due diligence you do at the front end to get everything in line, the more likely you are to find the right buyer in the uh, first and get the deal over the line as quickly as possible. It's, it's just that simple. The more due diligence you do and the more accurate your due diligence is, the better for you and the quicker you'll get deals across the line. So finding deals that work. So, Mark, I'm going to go back to your question now um, on networking with agents. Uh, OK, I'm just reading another question. Hang on a second. Right. So. Of course, you are you have some geographical identity as to the, the area that you're working in. But that geographical identity can it, it, it is flexible. Let's say that you've chosen flips. And let's say that you've chosen flips and you're looking to do flips in Blackburn. Again, I've chosen an area that I don't live in, which is really bizarre. I'm going to choose the area that I live in. So let's say you've chosen Cheshire, right? So you're looking to do ch uh, flips in Cheshire and you set yourself up on right move. This is the first place you go. You set yourself up on right move so that you, you've identified the areas within Cheshire that um, give you the best returns on, on doing a flip. And you've set up the automated alerts so that when something comes up that hits the right numbers, you get an automated alert. And then you take that alert and you contact, you can contact the estate agent straight away, right? That gives you the power to do that. Now, if you've if you've done your um, research and you've looked in Cheshire and after a week, you've got no alerts that are coming your way, well, then guess what? You need to broaden the geographical search that you're using. Obviously, the smaller the the smaller the, um, the the search that you do, the better for you because the less distance you have to travel. If ever you need to go to one of these properties, but that's how I build out the areas that I'm looking in. I'll start off small, and if I'm getting enough leads from that small area for the strategy that I've chosen, then I'll stay there. But if I'm not getting enough leads, I'll expand my search area, and I'll expand my search area. But I won't change the strategy that I'm looking for because that is, you know, my two to three year commitment to be to be executing on that strategy. So that's what I need to stick to. So that's how we start off. Um, uh, we start off building, building out the area that we're going to be looking in and always, always with the, the, the focus of efficiency on our mind. So if I can get away with a really small area because it's generating enough leads for me, brilliant. I don't need to make it any bigger. And I'm going to absolutely own that territory. That is going to be my area. And I'm going to be the person to go to on flips in that area. I hope that answers your question, Mark. So then, you know, obviously with, with the territory, with the ge geographical area that you committed to, you then network the living daylights out of all of these state agents in that area. And the way that I network with estate agents is, I, again, I go to right move first. I find properties that are on right move for that estate agent. I'll identify if any of those properties look like they're promising, um, as if they could be a, a good deal for one of my investors. And then I'll go and talk to the estate agent about that deal. I would recommend that everybody, and I've done this many times, I'd recommend that everybody goes to an estate agent without a deal to talk about, and then go into an estate agent with a deal to talk about. 
and see which one is more successful. Which one of those two estate agents gives the monkeys that you exist? It's the one that you're, you've gone into with the deal to talk about because essentially estate agents, they just want to get deals sold. So if you go into, go into an estate agency and you talk to them about a deal that they've got listed on their books, you're going to have far better success with that estate agent. So do your due diligence, save your due diligence for your investors, and then, um, and then we can start to advertise, advertise the deal. So let's say that we find a deal that's in our strategy that fits our, uh, fits our criteria. Well, it fits our criteria for an investor. It doesn't quite work well enough for us, for us to buy ourselves. So we're going to advertise that deal out to an investor now. So where do you go to, to advertise your deals out? And this is, you know, this is a really open-ended question. This is completely up to how creative you want to be and how dedicated you are as well. Now, we've made this really easy for our franchisees. You might have seen that we've got a, uh, we've, we've created a source property investment app. I'll show you it in just a second. And what that app does is it allows our franchisees to advertise their properties on there. And then we bring investors to look at the app and the investors look at the app and they can they can um, communicate directly with our franchisees through the app. So we've made this really, really simple for our franchisees. Now, you guys, if you're not a franchisee of ours, you don't have that available to you. So where do you go? How do you advertise deals out to get conversations with investors? Uh, while I'm letting you think about that, I'm just going to have a quick look at the questions. Why are you using yield and not return on investment? Um, just because it's the first number that came into my head. There's absolutely no other reason for it than that. Is it realistically possible to run this business remotely while being based in Portugal? It's a good question. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, there's, there's all kinds of uh, businesses out there that help you, you know, go on viewings for properties. Um, like Vuba is the one that comes to my head straight away. So absolutely, yes. If I do this on right move and I find a deal, but I have no company set up, no compliance in place, this is the risk you were talking about. Do I need to set up a limited company? So the limited company question is a question not for me. It's a question between you and your accountant because the, the, whole, uh, the whole purpose of a limited company um, is to limit your tax really well it's liability but it's also tax as well so it's a it's a it's a looking at your whole tax um situation and having that conversation with your with your accountant Sorry, I just muted myself while I coughed. Uh, that's a great question, Omar. How many uh, investors visit the app monthly? It's roughly, a, a, we, we generate around a thousand leads per month for our franchisees. That's the, that's the metric that we care about because that shows how much activity we, we're creating for our franchisee. Uh, how much is the franchise fee? Look, let's not get into that now. We'll I'll tell you about that later on. Do you tell estate agents you're a sourcer? Carla, that is a terrific question. And the right answer to that is it depends. It depends what I'm trying to do. Now, when you first go into an estate agent and you're looking at doing a deal, uh, looking at a deal, the first person that you're trying to buy that deal for is yourself. So at that point, I am looking for deals for myself. And I'll start to ask questions and I'll put the due diligence together and I'll have a look at the, the numbers. But all the way through that process, I'm still interested in buying this deal for myself. Now, if it doesn't work, I have had this conversation with estate agents over and over again. I've gone back to the estate agent and I've said, look, I really like this deal, but I just can't get it to work. And I've even shown them my deal calculator. I've shown them how the deal doesn't work. Now, I need it to be, you know, let's say a 40 percent margin, but I could only get a 25 percent margin out of this deal. So my question to you, Mr. or Mrs. Estate Agent is. Can I get this deal to a 40% margin where I can buy it? Or at 25% margin, I know some other people that would be interested in this. Is it more realistic 
that I go and talk to them and get one of them to buy it at 25% because I'm just not going to be able to squeeze a 40% margin out of it. Which one do you think is the most likely, Mr. or Mrs. Estate Agent? And I'll put that on them. I'll involve them in the conversation. I'll involve them in the in the thought, uh, in the decision-making process because I don't just want this one deal from them. I want them to get to know me and like me so that the next 10 deals that come across their desk that are similar to this, they pick up the phone and they talk to me straight away. So it's all about relationship building. So um, going back to the app, we've advertised the properties on the app. But what can you do if you don't have access to the app? So you can use social media, but let's face it, you know, it's got a really bad reputation now, hasn't it? Social media for, for, for deals that don't add up and don't make sense and nobody does their due diligence properly. So how else can you get out there and how else can you can you start to build a list of inv uh, of investors? Well, to be honest, I, I, some of you out there are going to be thinking, oh, why don't you go to a networking event? Yeah, I like the thought, but go big, go bigger and go better. Don't go to a networking event, start a networking event. Because if you go, if you start a networking event, the kind of people that you're going to be encouraging to come to your networking event are going to be either property sources or investors. And we we host our own networking events. We host sin events or we help our franchisees host sin events. And time and time again, I've seen people come up to our franchisees at the end of a night and say, oh, I really, really like that networking event. It was really good. I'm sorry that I didn't get the opportunity to talk to you. Anyway, I liked your presentation. I've got £100,000 and I don't know what to do with it. Can you help me out? And if, you, if the right thing for you to do then is to say, well, let me help you find the property, then you've got an investor on board. So think big, right? Don't think small. Think about how you're going to take over being the deal sourcing person in your area and go for it. Absolutely go for it. Now, even if you are going to start a networking event, you still need to, you'll still need to go onto social media. You'll still need to build your build your brand, bridge, build your credibility on social media, which you absolutely should do. Um, so it, this isn't the case of if you do this one thing, then you, you won't need to do anything else. You should be getting yourself out there as much as you possibly can. So what will happen if you go out there and you start start networking or you go to uh, you build your own networking event? And you um, you start building a social media presence and you start helping people out on social media. Then you'll start to build a list of investors that are following you, specifically following you and are interested in what you're doing. So let's get on to the next section. So this is the Source Property Investment app, by the way. Um, thousands of thousands of users every single week, loads of activity, thousands and thousands and thousands of property views every single week. Um, and you can go and download it now. It's absolutely free for, for investors to use. And actually, when franchisees come on board with us, um, we don't charge them for using the, 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 the app to advertise their deals on either. So now you've built a list and that's what these this this little pile of people right here is. They're, they are all the people that have inquired about your property. So they've either come through the app or they've come through social media or they've come to your networking event. And now you have their contact details and now you can start to advertise your deals out to them. So the first time you do this, this is the process. The first time you do this, you need to find a property. And you need to find your property first. And that property encourages people to come to you because they, they want to buy properties like that. But, but then your focus should change and your focus should be on your investors. And you should be nurturing and building relationships with your investors. And that's what you should be spending most of your time on. Because if you nurture those investors, instead of just bringing them on board with you and trying to sell them a property, and then get rid of them. That's a crazy, crazy outlook to have. Because each one of those investors might buy 10 properties from you, not just one. So if you nurture the relationships with those investors, well, now, every time you find a property, you don't need to put it on the app, or you don't need to put it on social media, or you don't need to take it to your networking event. 
every time you find a property now, you go straight to your investor. And if you go straight to your investor, you've got an established relationship with that investor. And it means that you can, you've got a much higher percentage chance of selling that deal to that person because they already know you and they already trust you because they've seen your previous work. So you keep on finding out, uh, finding deals. You keep on doing the due diligence of the deals and you keep on maintaining those relationships. And as soon as you see a deal that's going to suit investor A or investor B or investor C better than they're going to suit anybody else, then you pick up the phone and you talk to them. So what you need to do is you need to organize your investors into a kind of um, not hierarchy, but into into groups. So I personally have three groups of investors. I have the tire kickers who I really don't put any time or effort into maintaining. I have potential future investors and I have the Premier League of investors. So the number of people that I put in the tire kickers category is, is not limited. The number of people that I put into the potential future investors category is not limited. But I will only have in the Premier League of investors, I will only have a maximum of five or six of them. But those five or six should be ready to go, ready to buy at the drop of a hat. That's where they should be. So with the with the tire kickers, I put no effort into them. With the people that are potential future investors, I'll write an email to them roughly once a month. So once a month, I'll put an email together and I'll show them the deals that I've sold in that month. I've sh I'll show them the deals that I've looked at and the kind of the kind of decisions that I've made and any success stories that I've had from the previous month. Because I'm just nurturing that relationship. I just want to keep them interested in, in all the activity that I'm doing. And with the Premier League guys, those top five or six, then I don't email them. That relationship is on the phone. So I can walk into an estate agent. I can have a look for um, properties. If I find anything that works, I'll start to do the due diligence straight away. I'll obviously ask the estate agent if there's if there's any questions that they can answer. But I'll put all the due diligence together and I can call the estate, the, the um, investor from the estate agent and talk them through the deal. And then say to them, I'm currently I've just found this deal. It's literally on the market right now. I'm happy to secure it. Are you happy for me, for me to proceed? Now, if they need half an hour, I'll go and grab a coffee. I'll call them back in half an hour and I'll find out what they want to do. And if they want to go ahead with it, I'll then um, put an offer in with the estate agent right there and then. Now, that is, is the way that you build a scalable six-figure sourcing business. Instead of running around like a headless chicken, trying to uh, satisfy every single strategy, you just build that, build that sourcing business that has a very strong relationship with your investors so that when you come across properties that are going to suit them, you can call them up, you, you put all of your information together for them so they trust you and they'll see this. You know, they might, they might not back a couple of properties when they first start, but then they can see that you're putting your numbers together in a sustainable and in a, in a very detailed way so that when it comes to the point where you've found something that does suit them, then they're going to move forward with it. Now, with those five or six Premier League investors, if I had a conversation with one of them and they said to me that they're interested in a 10% return and they're interested in X, Y, Z, and I found a property that hit every single one of their metrics and they said to me, you know what, Chris, I don't want to take that property. I'll say, OK, fine. That's not a problem. It's not a problem that you don't take this one property. But if I show you another property that hits all of your metrics and you don't take that one, I'm going to take you out of my Premier League and I'm going to put you into my potential future investors. 
because you've told me what you're looking for. I found you exactly what you're looking for and you're not buying it. So what is the issue? Because you've got to remember when you're starting this business, when you're starting a deal sourcing business, that you are the rarity in this market. It's really easy to, to look at this and think, oh, my God, the investors, they're so they're so precious. I, I need so many investors. I need investors. You know, they're the, they're going to be the make or break of my business. It's the wrong way around. You are the make or break of their investing. Because without you and without the commitment that you have to put in your due diligence together correctly and um, build in relationship, relationships with all the relevant people, without you, it's very hard to replicate somebody that does exactly what you do. Whereas it's very easy to replicate what the investor does because all they're doing is bringing money to the table. So they're quite an easy thing to, to replace, whereas you are not. So you need to make sure that you're building those relationships with the investors. I'm just going to have a quick look at the Q&As here. Once the deal is secured, can we use Source to market and sell the deals to your investors? How much does Source charge for this? Uh, you'd have to be a Source franchisee. So no, you can't do that on an ad hoc basis. Why are some deals recycled, meaning posting time changes all the time, like every three to four days? Is it because it's not being sold yet and they want to refresh it? Uh, sorry, I don't, I don't understand that question. If you could expand on that, that'd be great. So organize your investors. through So three groups of investors, Premier League, future uh, potential future investors and tire kickers. That's how you organize them. <clears throat> so when you're when you're talking to investors to start off with. This is how you start to build a relationship with investors, because what most people, what most property sources do is when they'll they'll start to talk to an investor and they'll say, what, do, what is it you're looking for? And the investor will say, oh, I'm looking for HMOs in the north. And the, the property sourcer will say, OK, and they'll go away and they'll try and find HMOs in the north. That is not relationship building. All you're doing there is setting yourself up to fail. These are questions that you should be asking every single investor. So why did they inquire about the property? What exactly are they looking for? What have they already got? So you get to find out a little bit about their, um, their uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Experience. To them, what's the difference between a good return and a bad return? And again, that's really important because if they say 12%, I'd be happy with 12%. And then you find something for 12%, but they don't pull the trigger. Well then you need to have that conversation with them of if you, if I find you something else for 12 for 12% 12 and you don't pull the trigger, I'm going to take you out of my Premier League and I'm going to put somebody else in there instead. What are they trying to achieve long term? Again, you're trying to build a relationship with them so that you're helping them achieve their goals. It's not just a case of I'm going to find this property and you're going to add it to your portfolio. It's creating financial freedom. It's um, supplementing their re their their retirement income, it's helping their kids get on the property ladder. What is it? How do you get into that into their um, their long term aspirations? Because that's the way to not just sell them one property. That's the way to sell them ten properties. And I'd much rather sell ten properties to one person than have to find ten individual people to buy ten properties. That's a lot more work. And the word that I used at the start of this webinar was efficiency, because this is a business. So we're looking to be as efficient as we possibly could, can be. And then at that point, you can ask them what's in the pot, how much money have they got? And also, how much money will they add to the pot every 12 months? And then you can create a plan for them. And then you can show them how you fit into their plan. But importantly, if you think about the sales process, if you first of all, find out what is driving them then you can use that to justify why they should buy the property that they first inquired about because now you understand their motives and their motivation just going to check on the questions again yeah absolutely carla it's a good question if you do a plan for them are you running the risk that it's taken as financial advice or do you uh, do you do the plan but just clearly state it's not financial advice. Yeah, absolutely. Of course. Thank you very much for pointing that out. It's much, much appreciated.
So now the next part of this is critical. So the next part of this is signing uh, an NDA, or we've actually built our own NDA called a source to order agreement. So if you have a, if you're a source franchisee and you get an investor and that investor signs a source to order agreement, which states that if they ever buy a property from you, then they have to pay the fee that you've said on the property, on the, on the form that they've signed. So it's an agreement to say that, um, that fee will become due to you if they ever buy a property that you've introduced them to. And it's any property. So they don't have to sign an NDA for every single property you introduce them to because this one form covers all properties. So they sign an NDA. They sign the source to order agreement is what we call it. And as soon as they've signed a source to order agreement, you can share all of the details with them. You don't have to hold back because now you've got a contract between you and them which states if they buy anything that you've introduced them to, then um, they have to pay out. So now you share the due diligence with them. Now they can really scrutinize everything that you've done. And remember, this is only the first time that you need to get them to sign the source to order agreement, because the second time, the third time, the fourth time, that same source to order agreement is still going to be still going to be live. So you can still rely on that source to order agreement for the second, third, fourth and fifth time. So you can go straight to sharing the details with them. So you share it with, you know, let's say you get 20, 20 investors that are interested in this property. You get them to sign the source to order agreement you um, and you share the details with them. And one of them is going to uh, agree to purchase that property from you. So you agree the terms with one of them. And as soon as one of them agrees that, you ask them to fill in the reservation form. And the reservation form is filled out and the sourcing fee is paid straight. So the sourcing fee is payable as soon as they sign the reservation form. The sourcing fee goes into a client account. Technically, it's not your money yet. You haven't earned it. But the reservation form states that as soon as the property goes through exchange of contracts, then that's your sourcing fee is due. And you put that sourcing fee into a client account. So as soon as the, the, the property goes through um, exchange of contracts, you can take the, the money from that client account and pay it into your bank account. That's the way that you do it. I'd much rather that the money is sitting there waiting for me to earn it rather than um, going through exchange of contracts and then having to chase the investor to pay me at that point. That's the wrong way round to do it. Take the fee up front and put it into a client account. That's what client accounts are for. So that's the way that you uh, that's the way that you secure your sourcing fee. And then really, you just need to help the investor get through exchange of contracts. So you can liaise with the estate agent. You could even liaise with the solicitors. You can liaise with the with the investor, but you need to get that property through exchange of contracts. As soon as you get confirmation that it's gone through exchange of contracts, your fee is due and you transfer that money from the client account into your bank account. And that's when you earn your money. So then the next time you go through that process, instead of starting from zero, now you're going to start looking for properties and you've already got a list of 40 investors. And out of those 40 investors, you might have 10 people that are tire kickers. You might have 20 people who are um, in the future in future investors category, and you might have up to 10 people who are in your Premier League. Now, I wouldn't have 10 people, like I said before, I'd have five or six, but you could have 10 because you, know, you might be looking to scale this up much quicker than I was. So you've got 10 people in your Premier League so that as soon as you then find properties, you go directly to them. You're not advertising out there. You're not talking on, uh, you're not going out on social media. You've got direct links with people who are very, very committed and very serious about buying properties. And that's how you build your, your property sourcing business. Got three questions now. So let me just go through them. Uh, meaning one ad was first posted 10 days ago. Then after I see it posted just today. In the source. To, oh, in the sourced app. Uh, I don't know. I'd have to look into exactly why that was. It could be a glitch. It could be. Um, it could be that the the property was listed previously and then it's been listed again. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I don't know without looking into it in a bit more detail. So you can send me the details and of course I will look into it. 
Uh, how long does the process take? It can, it can take a couple of days. You know, from, from beginning to end, it can take a couple of days. It, it all depends. And from one, from one property strategy to another, it makes a big difference. So I'll give you an example. So if you're going to be looking for selling land, land traditionally takes a long, long time to sell. Right. So if you've got to wait before the, the, the land goes through exchange of contracts, there's going to be a massive amount of due diligence to be done up front before somebody commits to buying land. Right. So a normal conveyance in time at the moment is about six months. If you were going to buy a plot of land, it might be a year. Right. So from agreeing a sale to go through exchange of contracts on a plot of land could take a year. But if you're selling a rent to rent deal, well, nobody's buying any property in a rent to rent deal. Exchange of contracts is when the contracts are signed to rent that property. So that could take half an hour. So you've got two completely different property strategies there. One where you go through the whole process in half an hour, one that's going to take about a year. So it depends on what you're, what you're going to be, um, what strategy you're looking for and what experience you have in it, to be perfectly honest. So with sourced, obviously sourcing, deal sourcing and trading is one of the options that we give our franchisees, but it's not the only option because what we do is we send our franchisees leads. Out of those leads, they'll find a deal. We help them to assess those deals. We've got a support team that helps them assess those deals. And then essentially they've got four choices. They could forget it because it doesn't work. They could go through our funding because we offer in-house funding exclusive to our franchisees. They could put it on the app and try and sell it, or they could put it out to sourced auctions and they can put it through our auction process. So we give our franchisees really easy structures and strategies and ways of monetizing those properties. With the help from support, they go through source capital to get it funded. They can go through an auction process. They can go through the app to sell the deal. Oops. Or like I said, they can forget it. And support are there to help them all the way through those processes. Now, there's a huge amount of, we've talked very briefly about deal sourcing and trading. And this strategy, the way that I've just explained it, the, 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 the function that we have for this, it works. It doesn't matter what strategy that you're looking at, it works. What I would say, though, is each strategy might have a lot more information that you need to learn in order to sell those deals effectively. So, for example, if you're doing commercial conversions or new builds, you'll need to know the numbers on this table off the top of your head. So if you don't know what this table's for, it's for the minimum space standards when you're either doing a conversion or doing a new build property. So you will need to make sure that flats, one bedroom flats, for example, for one person are over 39 square meters. So when you look at a block of, of uh, a commercial block, you'll be able to work out how many of those flats you can fit into that commercial block. But if you if you just estimate that you can fit 100 flats in there, but they turn out to be under 39 square meters, you're not going to be able to do that. So HMOs, very similar. It's got a huge amount of legislation that are surrounding that surrounds HMOs. You know, look at just going to put you on mute again. So, for example, Article Four. Are, are you trying to say that somebody can do a HMO conversion in an Article Four area? Uh, are there covenants prohibiting them from doing that? Are you saying that somebody can take a rent to rent property in a building that doesn't allow it under the conditions of the lease? Um, are you proposing that somebody does serviced accommodation in London where there's a 90 night rule? Licenses, ombudsman, there's lots and lots of legislation and regulation um, based on the property strategy itself that you need to learn in order to effectively sell these deals. And that coming back to the, to, to the first point that I made of you need to be focusing on the strategy that you want to execute. That's another reason that you should put all of your eggs in that one basket, because that means that you can become an expert at that strategy. So that if anybody questions you because of you know legislation changes or, or whatever, you can answer that question. Whereas if you spread yourself too thin across lots of different strategies, you're much more likely to make a mistake um, and not know all the facts and figures that you need to for that area. And therefore, that can that can land you in trouble. 
we have lots of property tra uh, uh, strategy training courses. So for deal sourcing and, and packaging, for example, you know, this is normally a two day course. And I've tried to condense as much of it as I can into this into this one webinar. But this is normally a two day course that we go through with our franchisees. And we break it down into six sections, the six set steps to success, which are research, source, secure, structure, works and exit. And we go through them in a lot of detail with our franchisees. I hope you've got value from what we've been talking about today. So if you were going to start building this business on your own and you were going to, you know, start to build your business, start to build a, a, a brand, you were going to uh, invest in training. You were going to supplement your salary for a little while, and then you were going to have some investment capital to to buy your first deal with. You could easily be looking at saving up around fifty thousand pounds in order to facilitate you doing that. But then you've got ongoing costs as well. So if you're going to buy property leads, if you're going to buy investor leads, if you're going to invest into CRM systems, if you're going to continue to do marketing, look at a mentor. You know, all of these ongoing costs for property can easily cost you know. 50 grand to set up, five grand a month, something like that, which is a huge amount of money. Now, you can get all of these different things from all uh, from lots of different places. So if you're looking for training and support, you can get them from a trainer. If you're looking for unlimited support, you can get that from a mentor. If you're looking for investor leads and property leads, you can get them from a lead generation company. If you're looking to advertise your deal out, um, well, we have the app, but you can use estate agents or you can use agents to, to, to facilitate that for you. If you're looking for funding and an agreement in principle, you can get them from lenders. And if you're looking for joint ventures, you can look for a joint venture partner. Lots of different places that you need to go to put all of that package together. Here at Sourced, our package includes all of those things. And somebody asked me earlier how much this cost. So the, the cost of a Sourced franchise is £10,000 plus VAT, and that's for five years. So you don't pay that every year. That, that, uh, that brings you in for a five-year term and then it's £315 plus VAT per month. And you get all of that facility all the way through that five-year term. You get to advertise deals out on the app. You get to use our CRM systems. You get to use our support team. You get to use our mentorship. You get access to source capital who can fund your deals. It's all there for you in one place. So you don't have to go out there and start and you know build relationships all over the place. So that's the end of the webinar. I hope that's been really valuable for you. Um, if you've got any questions, I'm happy to stay around for 10 minutes now and answer questions. So I'm just going to put you on mute while I have a drink of water. Um, and if you've got any questions, please put them in the Q&A box and I'll, I'll hang around and answer the questions now. But thanks very much for being here. If you're going to jump off now, really appreciate your time. Thanks for being here. OK, I've had my water, so I'm back. Um, Carla, really appreciate that. Thanks for the feedback. Um, I really hope that you got some value from it. So um, so thank you. And thanks for asking questions as well. Questions are always appreciated. Um, how long is the onboarding for the sourced franchisee? So, yeah, that's a that's a it's kind of a complicated question. When you come on board as a sourced franchisee, you need to come to induction training at, at our head office. Um, the induction training is a couple of days long. The whole onboarding course, as in the, the content that we've created for you to for you to have access to, is probably another couple of days long. But you can do that at home. So it'll take you a few days um, to to go through all of that content and to come to our onboarding course, uh, our induction course. Sorry, and we've just had an induction just last week. So the next induction that we have is in two months' time. Are you able to share the slides? Uh, you'll be getting a recording of this, Chris. So um, look out for that in your email inbox. You'll probably get it within the next 24 hours. So if you haven't got an email from us in 24 hours, just check your junk. Um, and if you haven't got that, just get back in touch with us and we'll, we'll find another way of sending it to you. Can you elaborate more on the training that Source provides? Okay, sure. So we have over 200 training videos. Uh, but we also do face to face training as well with our franchisees. So we have 200 training videos that are on a platform that all of our franchisees can can access whenever they want to. 
Um, all the videos that we've created have had over eight years worth of viewings on them. So what I mean by that is they've been watched continuously for a time period of over eight years. So our franchisees lean on those videos a lot to learn all the different strategies. And we've got all of the strategies included in there. So we've got deal sourcing and packaging. We've got rent to rent HMO. We've got rent to rent service accommodation. We've got HMO. We've got flips. We've got title splits. We've got commercial conversions. We've got um, uh, we've got building relationships with investors. We've got funding courses. We've got everything that you can think of because we are not prohibitive. We do not prescribe what our franchisees can do to make money out of property. We're just here to facilitate and support them doing so. So we've got a huge amount of, of, of training. But then as well as the on, online training, we also have face-to-face -face training. So we put it, we make face-to-face -face training available because, you know, some people prefer to come and, and, and get, get trained face-to-face -face because they can ask whatever questions that they want to in a way that you can't do when you're learning online. So we do it we do it face-to-face -face as well. Uh, thanks for today. Very worthwhile. Can we obtain a recording of this as my business partner could not lock in? Uh, John, yeah, it will be sent to you in the next 24 hours or so. Good seminar. Thank you very much. Yeah, Sean, thank you. Thanks for watching. Really appreciate it. Uh, I'd like to talk to someone about how it would work from Portugal remotely. And is there a phase payment system and other? So you do need to you need to pay in full before you start. Um, that's a rule that we have for all franchisees, Mike. Um, but I can certainly um, I can put you in touch with Sam. Let me ju I'm just going to make a note of your name and I'll get uh, I'll get Sam to give you a give you a buzz, Mike. Uh, so first step, marketing, branding, compliance, registration, then networking and build investor relationships, then find the deals. Well, not for the first time, Reese. I would find a, a deal first and advertise that deal out there and use that to build to, to find those investor relationships. I think it's easier to start off with to find the deal and use that deal to bring the investors in. Um, so that's apart from that, you bob on. <clears throat> what value of PL and PI would you recommend for insurances? I'd, I, I always use an insurance broker and I go through the insurance broker. And one of the reasons that I go through the insurance broker when I'm having that kind of conversation, John, is that they're then giving me advice. And if their advice is wrong, then they have PI cover to cover their incorrect advice. So I would talk to a broker and get them to tell you what you should be doing in that situation. I hope that helps without just seeming like I'm not trying to answer the question. But I'd much rather it goes on to their PI insurance because that's what they've got PI insurance for. Uh, is this off market? I'm not sure what that refers to. I apologize. Uh, thank you, Mike. Thanks for your feedback. Crikey, there's a lot of questions. Uh, thanks, Chris. Great seminar. Thank you, Paul. Much appreciated. Great stuff. Thank you. Cheers, Reese. Thank you. And thanks for your questions. Really appreciate it. Personal manager, right? That supports franchisees. Yeah, your support person, uh, Omar. Yeah. Your support person helps the franchisees. Yeah, you will have a support person. Uh, if I'm all set up as a deal sourcer and want to join the franchise, same fee and the same time on to onboard. Yes, that's right. Exactly right. Right. That's all the questions done. So thank you very much. Really appreciate your time. Um, thanks for stopping by. And if you've got any questions, please get in touch with us at info at uh, And otherwise, I hope to see you soon. Cheers. Thank you.